Don't fall in love with every note that you put on paper. Be flexible enough to say, yeah, you know what, that's not working. You know, yeah. whether it be a personnel issue or writing a chart. You gotta be open to making those edits. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. As we put these together, what's exciting about it is when we find certain people like yourself that have got this incredible story of this golden age of the music industry when it was in the, the thick of so much going on in such a short period of time, and you were right there in the center of it. <laughs> I want to make sure. <laughs> Pretty intense. We captured this at all different levels. Tell me yeah. where music started for you in the beginning. How did music enter your life? Well, born up in Ayr, Massachusetts, uh, during the Second World War, and my father and mother, unfortunately, divorced very early on, and she remarried 49 or so, and my stepfather was a professional musician in Boston, and he got the gig as the band director out on Nantucket Island. So we moved out to the island, and now I got a band director as a father, you know, so obviously <laughs> there was a lot of music in the house, and, and during the winter, he would be the band director during the summer months, he had a jazz trio at a place called the Boathouse. Mm -hmm. well, the very end of one of those piers with a, a real nice dinner restaurant type of thing going on with the jazz. It was like a, a scene out of Mr. Lucky or Peter Gunn. <laughs> That's what it was like. And it was a jazz trio and the drummer was a young drummer from Boston that he had brought out for the summers, Salvador Rabio. Great drummer. Turned, ended up being the principal timpanist with the Detroit Symphony for oh, years, man. years and years. And so, you know, as a kid, you know, what do you want to play? Every kid wants to play drums. So <laughs> my dad says, you take a lesson from Sal. The first thing he hands me are metal sticks in a pillow. <laughs> I, wait a minute, I want to make noise. I'm like every other kid, you know. So we got over that phase. But I was trying all the different instruments in the band because on, on an island that small, it was only 2,500 year-round residents. Mm. The band, I think, was 21 pieces, and it was made up of all 12 grades. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you, you know, we tried everything. I tried this and some of that, and I landed on trombone and really liked it, mm. you know. So that's where it all began. We had jam sessions in, in our living room uh, there on Sunday afternoons, and they actually cut directly to acetate. Those were the old machines where you had, took a blank acetate, dropped the Absolutely. needle, and the, the VU meter was one of those green lights that flashes <laughs> up and down, down, down. Yeah, that's how it all started. How amazing. What kind of music were you listening to at that stage? Boy, it was well-rounded. We would listen to a lot of Stravinsky, Bartok, Leonard Bernstein uh, on the jazz side, you know, well, I was a big fan of the Canton Big Band, the High Lows, Stan Getz. Yeah. So it, it was across the map. You know. Well, you're hearing all this different music, you're playing, and you were playing with a variety of different people, so you were with trombone, now you're in bands playing and you're well, learning the, the skill well, of Well, yeah, music. I mean, this was only like uh, during elementary school, basically, right. so it was just the foundation, but the, the roots of all these different styles of music were uh, absorbed that way. We were there for about six years. So 1955, my father had heart issues. It was one of the first open heart surgeries in, at the Deaconess in, in Boston. Yeah. And the doctor said, you got two choices. You go to Arizona or Florida, stay here and die. You know, So yeah. he had played down in Florida. So we moved to Florida, which turned out musically to, to be quite rewarding in the fact that I ended up in a very large high school here with huge resources, the junior high and high, full orchestras, full bands, jazz bands. I mean, you know, the, I mean, there was 3,000 kids in the school, you know, where I came from a school of 21 in the band, you know. So the resources were, were just, all the opportunities expanded tenfold. You know, but, so what happened in the music industry that, that, that made you want to continue that? What was it that made well, you want to stay in it? I loved music, obviously, growing in it. Yeah. And, and as I was finishing high school, I had so many opportunities there. Well, one was I was the Arian Award winner as the top student in, in the music part. And in my junior year, I was the student conductor. Ironically, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened at the same time down yeah, here. Yeah. And our orchestra director was a Navy petty officer, you know, in reserve. Well, they brought him back up and sent him to Guantanamo. So for a whole year, I got to be the conductor of the orchestra under the guidance, you know. So, I mean, it kept expanding. And I, and I thought I really wanted to do this. But at the same time, watching my stepfather 
try and raise a family, work these ridiculously late yeah, hours, yeah, yeah. you know, come home at four or five o'clock in the morning. And then, you know, on weekends, he would just stay up and we would go to the beach together. He would do everything he could to be a, a father, yeah, you know, yeah. but at the same time, it's it's a hard life. Absolutely. You know, you know that as well Absolutely. as anybody. Yeah, yeah. So I received scholarships to LSU and Stetson and some others. And I took a pass. I heard about the Navy School of Music, that it was very good up in Washington, D.C. I thought, maybe I'll give this a shot, figuring, worst case, you know, in 61, 62, there was, there was nothing going on Absolutely, that I had yeah. to worry about. Yeah, yeah. And it, worst case, I come out with a four-year, you know, with a, a GI Bill, and I, if I decide to stay with music, I go full bore, yeah. and if I decide that I wanted architecture was something that always intrigued me, you know, if I decided then I could go that way, because when you finish in high school, I don't know if you were quite ready to make that <laughs> smart of a move, Absolutely. so I think the smartest thing I did was give myself time, Smart. and, smart and uh, as it turned out, I loved it, and music was the path that I pursued. Were you taking lessons at the time, private lessons, or was, was there a... There was never any private lessons in my life. You know, really? except for my dad. I mean, in the sense that when I was in high school, he was writing arrangements. So I was doing his copying, you know, and, and learning his arranging. Te- so I was constantly assimilating, you know, but there were no real private lessons. When I mustered out during the four years, it was intense because the School of Music was in Washington, D.C. Yeah. So we're there when Kennedy is assassinated. And because he was Navy, his family requested Navy. So I was actually on the driveway of the White House holding a state flag as the case on and all that went by. I mean, you talk about intense experiences yeah, that yeah. stick with you. Yeah, yeah. Charles de Gaulle and everybody that far. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and then they promptly, the next thing I know, we got shipped off to Vietnam for the next two years. You know, well, so. This is, this is now you know, 56 years ago. Yeah. You know, in in, in uh, November 22nd, 1963, when Kennedy was yeah. assassinated. So yeah. you're a young kid to experience that. <sighs> The emotion of the time really? in the country and in the world yeah. was at such a high, high level. Yeah. So here you are. You're in the Navy. Now you get shipped off. Yeah. You're there for how long? Two years we spent the better part in the Vietnam theater. You yeah. know, we were based in Japan, but yeah. we were with the Admiral of the 7th Fleet, so you had to be in the thick of things. Yeah. So we were there during the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, we were in Saigon a number of times. We were in Da Nang. I'm still on an Agent Orange protocol right now with the VA. You know, because of our time in Vietnam. Unbelievable. At that yeah. time, boy, it's so... T- yeah. Listen, that was historically, that yeah. was a yeah. really difficult yeah. time. And when you came back, there was a lot of anti-war sentiment. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when you came back from Vietnam, it was not something you advertised, you know. The, the Vietnam vets were not accepted yeah. well when they came back. It was a difficult time. I no, it was. Really well. It was it, very, very it, challenging. You kind of kept it to yourself. Yeah. yeah. So you came back. So, yeah. so did, you, did you kind of veer towards music at that yeah, time? I was absolutely convinced that's the direction I was okay, going. Great. I was able to get out of the Navy a month earlier. So, you know, if you were enrolled in college. Right. So I went to Miami-Dade, and ironically enough, the, the trombone instructor there was my intern in junior high school, you know, who had gone through Florida State, John Alexander. I was there for a couple of weeks and realized I didn't fit in. I mean, I'm four years older than everybody else. Yeah. I've had experiences with body bags in Vietnam yeah. and things yeah. that I can't relate to somebody just coming straight out of high school. It was yeah. just, you know, and John, you know, he and I played duets one day. He says... We're not going to do lessons. He says, just get out of here and keep doing what you're doing, you know, that kind of thing. He helped me get on gigs. We, I started working professionally immediately, with doing shows with Buddy Greco and stuff like that. And within months, the bass trombone chair on the Jackie Gleason show, which was taped on Miami Beach, yeah. opened up, and I got a call. And I became the bass trombone player on the Jackie Gleason show at the age of 22. This, this yeah. is amazing. And yeah. People have to realize that. First of all, you mentioned Buddy Greco. Yeah. Buddy Greco was a phenomenal musician. Unbelievable. Yeah. Phenomenal musician. Yeah. So to even, you have that experience of playing yeah. Yeah. where now you, you, your, your skill base is amped up to a higher level. Sure. The Jackie Gleason show, and I remember as a kid, it was a huge show. Oh, yeah. This was some serious musicians. So now yeah. you're playing on that show. Yeah. How long did that show go on for? I did the last three years. It was on the air, 67, 68, 69. Wow. So I jumped in in 67, did that. And talk about an experience. I mean, you know, because, I mean, we played there with 
Groucho Marx, yeah, yeah. George Jessel, you know, Louis Armstrong. Yeah. Louis Armstrong played the show, and as you're doing a TV show, when they're doing camera angles and lighting and stuff, yeah. and we're in this empty hall, so he would come out and sit there, and the whole orchestra, it's a big orchestra, the Sammy Spear Orchestra. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, it's like a huge big band, huge string section, the whole thing. So we're sitting out there in these em the empty hall, and Louis regaling us with all <laughs> these tales, you know, half of which you can't repeat, but, <laughs> you know. What legendary, oh, legendary story. Huge. Do you remember who the drummer was on the, on the Jackie Gleason show? Uh, Bob Lally. Bob Lally. Boy, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. He was a phenomenal musician yeah. of what they did. So the quality of musicianship that you played oh, with. The him. band was um, unbelievable. Billy yeah. Butterfield. I mean, yeah. there were some strong, strong players in yeah. that band. You know, and, and they all warned me. You know, And Sammy Spear, bless his heart, is the nicest man in the world. Yeah. The world's worst conductor. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, he was good at doing the fast twos and all that sort of stuff. But the guys in the band said, whatever you do, take the downbeat from Sammy and never look back. <laughs> <laughs> Smart advice for sure in the process. Yeah. The, the people that were on that show at that time, I mean, when we speak about legends, the Bob Hopes, the Groucho sure. Marx, like I said, Louis Armstrong, these are, these are, you know, Jackie Gleason was huge himself right. as a yeah. star. What was it like to just to be around these people and the energy that was going on at that time? Pretty overwhelming for a 22-year-old kid, yeah. 23 yeah. at that point, something yeah. like that. Kind of sitting in awe. That, that like It's like a motion picture of Americana going, yeah. running by before your eyes. Yeah. And in that era, we would do a variety show one week and a honeymooners the following. We would rotate back and forth. The girls would change, but Art Carney was there. So watching Gleason and Carney do these honeymooners skits <laughs> was priceless. Yeah. I mean, because during the rehearsal, we would see the teleprompter. So we knew what the storyline was from A to B, yeah. you know. Well, they would go through the rehearsal fine. And then at night, he and Carney, Cleason and Carney would start ad-libbing, and the girls looked like they were deer in headlights, <laughs> you know. But somehow they always got from A to B, but how they got there sometimes was astonishing to watch. I mean, the, that interplay between yeah. two giants like yeah. that, you yeah. know. And Gleason, on top of being such a great actor, he knew television inside and out. I mean, he knew lighting, he knew camera angles, I mean, a lot of times we would sit there and just be waiting while and watching him on stage, mm. but watching him, the knowledge he had of the entire industry, not just being an actor, yeah. was was eye opening. But he know? was he was also as a musician. I mean, he was yeah. as a dancer. Yeah. I mean, you know, years ago these it seemed like the quality of these these great legends did it all. There was a lot of that. They yeah. did it all. Yeah. yeah. They did it all. Yeah. You know, they're very different like in today where, where people get specialized into one yeah. thing. Yeah. These guys did it all. Sure. So now you, you, you're working with the band. This gig ends. Where do you go next? Well, I mean, the beauty of it is you only did 13 shows a year. Oh, interesting. You know? So if I had all the other days off making ridiculous mm -hmm. amount of money as yeah. a single guy. Yeah. The best part is during the summer when they show the repeats, you stay home and they still get paid, oh, you know. Gosh. So it allowed me <laughs> to, you know, I was doing other gigs on Miami Beach at the Eden Rock, uh, the Supremes, whoever the acts were coming through town. But it also allowed me with the, the funding to start to build my own bands. And I started like these horn bands, you know, because it was a time, around the time, we were getting into the time of Blood, Sweat and Tears, Chicago. Yeah, you sure. know, so the mixing of the, the swing music with the, the rock and roll world, yeah. you know, was starting to happen. Earth and so fire, it allowed me, yeah, yeah, it, it yeah, allowed yeah. me that freedom yeah. to start doing that. Yeah. And also during the Gleason though, because of the summers being off, I got a call to go out with Buddy Rich's band on one summer, I toured all across the country, and geez, at one point in LA, Art Pepper, the amazing alto saxophone, yeah, so yeah, great, yeah. and Al Porcino joined the band the same day. You know, a few weeks later, we were in Las Vegas at the Caesars Palace and recorded a live album from three to six in the morning. You know, Unbelievable. so that, you know, and that's um, to this day one of the most remarkable Buddy Rich albums going, you know, the Mercy what, Mercy. What year was that? 68. 68. That was the summer of 68. Pretty much the beginning of his big band and what he had done. Yeah. yeah. There were some before, but yeah. that, this was pretty early on. 66. He started 68. Yeah. That that album, Mercy, Mercy, Mercy. Yeah. Listen, it, it is an all time classic buddy album. It, it, it was. So mind boggling. What was that like to record at that time when they recorded it? This was like a live. 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 Live yeah. recording. Yeah. Were there mics on everybody? Yeah. Was it, was there yeah. What they did is, you know, during the show, you had the Caesar's Palace 
stuff for the Tony Bennett show. Right. After we did the last show at midnight or whatever it was, and we went back to the hotel for a couple hours, then they swapped out, put in their recording quality microphones. Right. They re left the band saying what kind of way it was, just changed the, the miking out yeah. and got themselves ready so that when we came back at three, you know, it was still the same setup, but you know, now that the quality microphones were there to where you get the recording. Yeah. And what they did is they invited uh, all the bartenders and the waitresses and the musicians from the strip to come in for free, you know, I mean, there was no charge. They would come in and we had an, an audience that you wouldn't believe of, <laughs> of like our own peers, you know, the, yeah. the music, great, a lot of great musicians in that yeah. day in Vegas, yeah. uh, as well as the, the bartenders and the waitresses and everything else. So it was, it was quite an evening. I'll what say. an energized crowd, I'm sure Ooh, it was, because yeah. it, it, that's just the vibe of the yeah. But yeah. listen, you're talking Buddy Rich and Tony Bennett. These are like, what was it like just to be around the presence of these people? At, by that point, you know, I've been doing it for a couple of years and I'm, I was starting to almost feel normal about it, <laughs> you know, because when you're 22, you just, you, you know, when you're in high school, you never envision yourself being in that situation. And now it was repeating itself on a, almost a daily basis, yeah, you know, yeah. so it was kind of overwhelming at times. But the more you grew into it, you know, the, the, the more confidence you gained. I mean, I'll never forget the first time I had a solo, bass trombone solo, and on the Gleason show, you're talking, it's going out live. In yeah, three yeah. years, we never did a second take. Wow. In three years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the first time I had a bass trombone solo, as we're getting closer and closer to the solo, I hear, see ears growing off the side of this microphone, you know. I mean, it's just like, you know, how are you going to requite yourself on this, you know. <laughs> so, but... With each experience, you know, you gain more confidence and get comfortable with it. There was a certain amount of awe every time, the first time you worked with Tony Bennett, you know, the first yeah. time you worked with who, anybody, you know. It was still pretty overwhelming. So you're putting your own band together. You've got right. your own orchestra that's happening. Right. And you're backing up different artists that are coming into town. Right. The Gleason show ended after right. the 69. So we ended up, I had one of the horn bands. We had the, the gig at the Newport Beach Resort. And we were just, you know, doing that, and they had dancers. It was a, like a nightclub. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. they would, the entertainment director decided he wanted to start doing a few name and acts. So they hired Frankie Avalon to come in, and he asked me, he says, you got a horn band, can you put together a full band to back up a name act? Yeah. That was the first time. I said, sure, I have no idea, but, you know, there it was. Yeah. So we put together a 13-piece band for, for Frankie Avalon. The reviewers were there. The next morning, open up the paper, and the headline of the article is, what a difference a band makes. <laughs> Didn't even mention Avalon. <laughs> you know, because it just, there, there were a lot of bands down here in those days yeah. where guys had come here to retire, yeah. to play golf. So they were, they were, most of them were very good musicians in their heyday, but they had just kind of let it go, yeah. you know, that yeah. kind of yeah. thing. So, you know, that's why it made such an impact on the reviewer. Well, that led to more of these Wilson Pickett's and Frank Gorshins and yeah. all of that. And by the early 70s, I was introduced to Bobby Van at Bachelors 3 in Fort Lauderdale. That Bachelors 3 was Joe Namath. Joe Namath's club, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ray Abruzzi mm -hmm. and Bobby Van. Right. And they mm -hmm. built the first one in Birmingham, Joe's hometown. Yeah. But they had met in New York, and Bobby was running Guys and Dolls, I think it was. So he was at the Fort Lauderdale Club, asked to meet with me because he had heard my reputation starting to grow. So I went there and it was a huge move because now we were getting into the early 70s. We're, the first two acts we did with Nancy Wilson, Mel Torme. Then it went on to the, the Temptations and Four Tops, Little Anthony. I mean, <laughs> it was a parade, a lit litany of these artists just coming through on a regular basis. You know. And did they have their own charts? Did they yeah, have their own music? Yeah. Yeah, so you guys so, were all reading the stuff, rehearsing. Yeah, through. we had one one afternoon mm -hmm. of rehearsal, and you open that night. Yeah, that's it. It was a, a huge experience to have that happen. At the same time, there were two huge things that happened during the five years we were at Bachelors Three. Was that a young kid by the name of Jaco Pastorius came back to town? He had been out with Wayne Cochran and the CC Writers. Yeah. I was, as I mentioned, I was still searching. I had the horn players I wanted, but didn't have the rhythm section that I wanted yeah. because guys could either play the swing era really good, yeah. and they could kind of get the duple meter, yeah. you know, rock and roll rock thing, thing. Yeah, yeah. but not quite. Or they were really good at the rock and roll and had no clue about the swing <laughs> era. And I needed, you know, I needed to play the Temptations one day yeah. and, and Mel Torme the next. And Jaco on bass. Yeah. 
well, could I do heard, anything. Yeah. Oh, I heard about this kid, yeah. you know, and yeah. I asked around, and I heard that, well, he's a great player, but he's got an attitude. You can't work with him. I said, bingo, that's exactly what I'm looking for is that attitude. Yeah, you know, yeah. the, the light went on. We called him in, and he came in with uh, Bobby Economo on drums and Alex Starkey, and it was the rhythm section that I had yeah. always wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you knew with Jocko that you literally had this humongous talent that's yeah. tiger by the tail. And you just, I knew that day it was going to be a wild ride. Yeah. Just knew at that point. You know, so that whole Jocko episode start there and it that will go on for years, you know, until his demise. But at the same time, right in this room, Carl Richardson was an engineer here at Criteria, had heard my band there at Bachelors Three and the the horn section and playing rock and roll the way it's supposed to be played. Right. He says, I want you to put together a horn session for an upcoming record we're doing with Dr. John. I said, okay. You know, I mean, I'd barely heard of, you know, I had to do a little research, you know, yeah. to get a little more backstory. And it turns out it was right in this very room. We put a cluster of mics, the four horns, stood around facing each other with Alan Toussaint sticking his head in the middle of it and just creating that whole Dr. John vibe. And it was awesome. My first chance to, to be the leader of a horn session and a recording thing. And it goes to number one in the country. Bam, thank you. And we finished the sessions. Dr. John McRobinette comes out of that booth, comes out, he says, you dudes positively Bonnaroo. And we look at each other, what the hell is that? You know, and what's Bonnaroo mean? You know, it's a Cajun word meaning the best of what is. So we became the Bonnaroo horns that day, That's right here hysterical. on this spot. In this room. And yeah, and the Bonnaroo horns went on to have this whole career of itself in the recording industry. I mean, next, uh, uh, Bill Wyman heard that session yeah. from the Rolling Stones. We recorded a solo album of his right here, Monkey Grip Glue. You know, now I've got these two giants on my resume. The next thing you know, we're getting a call from the Electric Flag, Buddy Miles and Mike Bloomfield. We're doing a session with with them and just one after another, it became a blur. You know, I, I can't even remember half of them. So you know. at that time, you, you've got, I mean, th there's no preparation for this. No. Pete, there, there really isn't. You know, no. you, you're in the thing of, you know, when they speak about, you know, how do you get experience? Well, you got to do it to get experience, but they won't hire you, so you can't get the experience. <laughs> yeah. You were thrown into the, this is really baptism by fire. Wow, I mean, this absolutely. Was, you were thrown in, and yeah. here you are, like, reacting in the moment, in yeah. the now, sure. with these acts of what it was like. So, so you're going on now, you're doing this here. Now, the horn section, much like the Tower Power Horn section, right. you're getting hired to do all these different events and these different dates. Right. So you're doing live dates, are you still at, at, at clubs performing while you're recording? Well, yeah, well, we were still doing Bachelors 3 at night, right. and we'd be down here during the day doing sessions, you know. So, I mean, it was the best of both worlds, yeah. you know. And it was intense. I mean, sometimes, like, Alan Toussaint had a pretty strong idea of exactly what he wanted yeah. us to play. Yeah. But a lot of time, there were no charts. In that first session, he would sing a lick. We would work it out, decide if we were going to voice something out to unison, what we were going to do. And he'd say, all right, that's lick number one. And then we'd learn a different one. And, and the track would be going on. And sometimes we'd play lick number one starting on the first beat of a measure. And then we might play the same lick, but starting on the third beat oh, of the measure, to, just to turn it around, you know, that kind of. So it was an amazing growing experience for me to see that done because I, I was used to everything being notated, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it was a, a growing thing to see that whole thing and let it grow organically. So when we did the Bill Wyman, it was a mixture of both things. You know, he had ideas that he would right, sing to me, right. and some, sometimes I would chart them out, or I'd have an idea, and he'd say, well, in this part of the song, I want some chords and stuff, but here, let's come up with a line. And so he would give me, I would take a tape home the night before, and have the pressure of trying to sketch this all out the night, you know, the night before, and bring it back in the next day. So it was it was baptism by fire. Absolutely. But you know what's yeah. amazing about it is the creative moment. Sure. You're forced to to create in that moment, and and, and you know how your your mind is just you know revving at such a high level. You've got all these great musicians that are around right. you, so you're feeding yeah. off of each other. That's a magical time to sure. have them around. Yeah, and and when you have that many talented people around, different guys come up with ideas, yeah. you know, that you don't even think of. So it it really is a, a group effort, in, in quite often. Fantastic. So what happened? Now? So now you're going on three places. That's, still that's, that's still that, going on. That's still going. How long did that go on for? Uh, that went on until about 1976, spring of 76, and it was only a, a few hundred seat 
nightclub, you yeah. know, one of the old supper clubs, and they kept expanding and pushing the walls out. Yeah, yeah. And it finally came to a, a finite moment when they just couldn't compete. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a, a whole chain of clubs in that, uh, the Holiday House up, I think, in Pittsburgh and right. different places. But the acts did, a, it was like a circuit, right. you know. At the same time, Sunrise Musical Theater was coming out of the ground, a brand new 4,000 seat proscenium type of a theater. And all the band leaders in town were clamoring, you know, to get their foot in the door. And Bachelors was ending. And I got the call. They called me and said, we would like you to come up and, and interview for this gig. I said, okay. And then I had a couple of martinis at lunch. And I went and talked to the producer. He said, you're my guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then that was it. But, I mean, it was like this heady moment because you're going from like a nine-piece horn band yeah. now to like 40-some-odd-piece orchestra right. with full string sections yeah. that you got to have. And it was just a huge step up yeah, at that yeah, point. Yeah. And we opened up in December of 1976 mm -hmm. with Bobby Vinton. And over the next month, uh, we knew I was facing Henry Mancini, Frank Sinatra, Debbie Reynolds, Bob Hope, Engelbert Humperdinck, I think, in the next, just in the first five weeks, yeah, you know. Yeah. And at that same time, as Bachelors was closed, Jocko got his record deal, you know, and so he started the recording. So now his career is going on, and I'm going up to play on his record at the same time. Unbelievable. And this is going in this. So these two different things are going on. And that over the years, I became his musical director when he formed his big band. So, but the, the Sunrise Musical Theater was a huge event. You're staring at the idea of Frank Sinatra is just enough to, to bring anybody <laughs> to their knees, you know. And when we were getting close, we did had like two or three weeks before Sinatra showed up. And then I get word from the, the producer, the guy who had hired me, said that Sinatra wants two days of rehearsal instead of one, which kind of put me a little bit on edge to yeah. begin with, and because it's always one day yeah. open that night. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm nervous enough, you know. And so we finally get there to the two days before. So we still got a show from whatever, whoever was in the week before. We still got another show that night, but we're rehearsing with Sinatra that afternoon. So we come in, we start, we do one hour, 45 minutes or so of the rehearsal, take, take 10. So the guys go out back, and Ben Siegel's the only guy sitting in the theater, the, the producer. And Sinatra went to his dressing room, and Ben signals me to come up to the front of the stage, and he proceeds to tell me what had gone on. Sinatra wanted to bring his own band from New York, oh. and Ben had gone out on a limb and said, do two days. If you don't like this orchestra the first day, I'll bring your band in oh, my at my nickel for opening day. I was nervous enough before, you know, <laughs> knowing that and that we had... <laughs> Cross that hurdle, Sinatra says, go home, I'll get see you guys tomorrow, we're good to go. Oh, you know, man. good thing I didn't know that because I was already nervous enough. And talk about opening night, the band played its buns off. You get to the middle of the show where he usually says the Joe Blow Orchestra and everybody stands up and they take a little bow and he introduces his guys, Bill Miller and, you know, the key yeah, guys and yeah, Irv yeah. Cotler on yeah, drums, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Turns around and he looks at me and he says, points right at me and he says, you, stand up. By myself. Yeah. Four thousand people sold out every A team guy in the in the room, all the press. And he proceeds to tell the audience what a talent and a, a resource that you can't let go. Oh, yeah, from yeah. and it it seemed to me like it went on for nine years. It was probably thirty <laughs> seconds, you know. But then we had the and, and it was like the next day, you, I could have taken that to the bank. It was like putting money in the bank. I mean, it cemented everything I had been doing. Unbelievable. You know, with as a leader up to that point for those eight years or so, and never looked back from that point on. And he kept us on as his orchestra in the southeast for the last 20 years. You know, when he would come to Florida, certainly, but you know, if he was going to Atlanta, New Orleans, we usually would do a couple of dates in Florida, and then we'd either uh, bus it or, or fly. Usually he flew us, and we'd stay at, you know, Four Seasons, beautiful hotels, took great care of us. You know, hey, and it was a wonderful ride. When, uh, you, when you think about that, you know, these stories, I mean, first of all, just to say Sinatra, <laughs> yeah. just to say Sinatra. I know. For him to 
endorse you and give you that kind of attention mm. meant, listen, he was a serious musician at what yeah, he did. Sure. And he really kind of heard greatness. And when he heard greatness, he gave credit to it. So yes. that's an incredible yeah. story yeah. that you have that level. Now, from that point on, once Sinatra gives you that blessing, mm. once you get that blessing from Sinatra, <laughs> the doors open up, right? There, there was no, no stopping. You know, I mean, we were starting to tour with everybody when they would come to Florida, you know. And not only would we play the, the gigs at Sunrise, but if they had dates in Tampa or Orlando or whatever, just like, Look, let's work it out so you are be the orchestra for all of those, rather Incredible. than them having to rehearse a different orchestra in each town, you know. Incredible. So it was just like the doors opened up. It was like the floodgates. Unbelievable. So now, yeah. Jocko is, has his career going on. Right. Did yeah. you hear much that was going on from him at that well, point? Well, yeah, he had done the Bright Size Life with Pat Metheny. Right. Well, ironically, back at Bachelor's Tree, there was one show where I had Jocko and Pat Metheny in the band at the same time, in the house <laughs> band. How about that? You know. But he had done Bright Size Life, and then he recorded his debut album, which was just floored the world of electric yeah. bass playing, yeah. you know. And I went up and I played on Come On, Come Over, the the song with Sam and Dave, yeah. you know. And I go up there, and, and I'm, you know, I'm pretty full of myself yeah. at that point, you know, with everything else going on in my life, you know, it's going well. But you walk into a studio, and there's Michael Naranja Walden on drums, Herbie Hancock on, on keyboards, you know, <laughs> Jocko, of course, on bass, Sam and Dave. The other horn section is, is, is Dave Sanborn, Michael Brecker, Randy <laughs> Brecker. And I'm looking at myself, what am I doing in this room? You know, that was about as intimidated as I'd ever yeah. been, to be honest with you, you know, but it was a memorable, memorable day, you know, and I'm just so proud of it. And then, again, these things were going on parallel. We had Jocko, so then, you know, in between his weather report gigs, he'd come back and play with the band, yeah. and then he formed his own. I'd go out as his conductor and bass trombone player, you know, with the word of mouth band. We're still doing Sinatra, and the follow-up to the stuff here with the Bonnaroo horns is by 76, the same time we're starting Sunrise, I get called from the Bee Gees saying, we want you to fly over to the Isle of Man to interview, so I fly over there, they love, you know, everything goes well. <laughs> the next thing I know, we're, we're recording Children of the World in this room, you know. We're touring the United States, and we do a live album here at last, a double album with the Bee Gees. So, <laughs> I mean, all these three things, the Bee Gees, Sinatra, and Jocko, were going on simultaneously, you know, the overlap. And there were times, you know, I had to tell Jocko, no, sorry, I'm like a little tied up with one of these others. You know? Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. Talk about... Mentors like Henry Mancini. Oh, what was that like to have a mentor like that? I, I can't put a price tag on what Hank Mancini meant to me. Yeah. It was two: Hank and Tommy Dowd here. Tommy but Dowd, Hank, yeah. even probably more. I've been a side man on one of his shows before that. But the, that first month at Sunrise, um, uh, same month as Sinatra came in, he had n knew me as a bass trombone player. Now I'm the, the orchestra leader. Yeah. And he, he pulled me aside after one of the, the breaks in the rehearsal and said, I really like what you're doing. You know, there's really, I want you to come to dinner with me. So, you know, after the rehearsal and before the opening that night, we would go to dinner and this started a thing where every time he would come through and in multiple days, we would go out to dinner and he would talk to me about uh, he knew I was into arranging. I was always into his, his I had his book already, mm -hmm. The Sounds and Scores, where he gives printed examples of his music and, and a recording of it. So you can Beautiful. see how that's it all work. And we got to really delve into some of his orchestrational ideas and, and how to lead a band and how to hire a band and, and don't get too comfortable with your friends because you know, they may not be the right fit. You know, all the time, you know. And when it came to arranging, he says, the first lesson I taught, taught myself, and that's him, Hank talking to himself, he says, don't fall in love with every note that you put on paper. Be flexible enough yeah. to say, yeah, you know what, that's not working, you know. Yeah. Whether it be a personnel issue or writing a chart, you know. you got to be open to making those edits, you know. That is yeah. fantastic. What do you think? What do you think he saw in you? Certainly a, enough talent to invest some time in him, but... But the willingness to learn, I think. And a lot of mine went back to starting in the Massachusetts educational system. Mm -hmm. They didn't necessarily teach you the answers. You didn't memorize answers. Right, right. What they did, they gave you the tools to get to the answer. Right. And I think that's something that stuck with me 
more than anything. And I think maybe I would hope to think that that's one of the things that Hank saw in me that, you know, I, I wasn't so full of myself that I thought I knew everything, but I could get to the answer. How did you balance the whole family thing with this here? Like you Ooh. said with your, your stepdad, it was difficult. Yeah. How did you balance all that? My oldest daughter was born in 1980. So we'd had three years of this heady thing with Jocko and the Bee Gees and, and doing Saturday Night Fever right in this room. That's a whole other story <laughs> we can talk about. But mm. around 80, the, the recording side of the industry, the, the, the bean counters kind of got control of yeah, things. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. there had been some huge budgets between the stuff we were doing, Eric Clapton and everything else. And so the, the, the budget started contracting and there were less and less horn sessions, less and less string sessions, more and more synth work right. being done. Right. And now I've got a daughter, you know, not only am I married, and you know we have the, but the family is growing, so it was a it was a, a tough emotional time. You know, it's like you know my the the, the income starts you know contracting a little bit yeah. because of the recording thing. Still doing a lot of live things, and that's all well and good, but the time that you can spend at home with your kids and everything else, you know. So as that industry changed a bit here on the recording side. I found myself where I never wanted to go into the club date side of things. Right. I just, I didn't like the musicianship levels. It was just didn't appeal to me at all. Yeah, yeah. But there was a reality now of I've got a family to yeah, support, yeah. you know. So and it paid well. And it paid well. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I said I'm going to go into there. But if I do it, I'm doing it with these same guys, these recording level players. Nice. And I'm going to do it on that level. You know, if I'm going to do it, it's going to be done on that kind of a level. Yeah. So that's the level that I tried to bring to the, the corporate and social side of things. And we were doing like Don Shula's events in, and yeah. all of that sort of thing. Cadbury Schweppes loved what we were doing. So they would take us around the country, do dates in Palm Springs and different places all over, you know. So we were able to bring that same level. So to, you're working with great musicians. Yeah. You're playing some fun music. Right. Making some good money. Exactly. And you've got the balance of your family. Right. And still Beautiful. doing the, the date with Sinatra when he was yeah. in the area. Yeah. Still getting to work with Jocko. And we would, went to, did a huge Japan tour in 82, which was awesome, you yeah. know, to say the least. Uh, with the, Randy Brecker and Two Sealmans. And, and it was like the Oryx Jazz Festival. There was like 12 different bands. We all met up in, in Tokyo for a ceremonial sake opening. <laughs> you know how they do all of that <laughs> sort of thing. And Woody Herman band was there, J and K. So we met up there and then the part of the Oryx Festival was that everybody would play a different town. You know, one night in Tokyo, one night in this town, that town. And then we would all meet up in Yokohama in the stadium and do a mass band thing at the very end of the tour. You Unbelievable. Know? But it was incredible. I mean, the moments. Tommy Flanagan was with one of the bands and I remember we were back in the hotel in uh, Shinjuku there in, in uh, Tokyo. It was Everybody's tired, you know, you're working the crazy travel schedule, touring. But it was like at the end of the night, it had to be after midnight, and, and Tommy Flanagan's sitting down just playing the piano, the lobby piano by himself. And Randy Brecker and I were sitting having a cocktail, last call. Two seamen walks up, sits down on a couple of steps right by the piano. And Randy and I are sitting there having a cocktail and listening to these two giants yeah. just playing from their heart, yeah. you know. Just, was playing, harmonica. Even, just oh, playing harmonica. Yeah. yeah, harmonica and piano, oh. two jazz giants. Yeah. And Randy and I are just looking at each other saying, man, that's what it's all about, you that's know, beautiful. in that world, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, to have these experiences, but that was no audience, no tickets, you know, it was just the, the moments that you, you have on the road are, are, can be wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Excruciating yeah. at times. <laughs> <laughs> but the journey that you have been on and that you continue to stay on, Pete, is really, really something where I say it's going to be captured in, in, in book form for future generations to hear. Because it really I've been told that. <laughs> It really yeah. is very, yeah. very important. Yeah. We have these young, great musicians that are listening to these stories and they mm. watch these interviews and they, mm. they, are, they can feel the passion as you're speaking. In closing, what would you say to this next generation of advice that you give them to kind of give them this food of thought that they can take and maybe apply to their lives? Well, follow your dream. No yeah. matter what, follow your dream. Yeah. I was a little bit more too logical sometimes, but follow your dream, but have a plan B. Yeah. Mine was architecture because it involved some of the same elements of music. Yeah. The art side, it had the math side. 
you know, and I'm still fascinated by architecture yeah. to this day. But follow that dream, you know, and do it young. You know, when you don't have a family, that, you know, encumber, that's hard because once you have the family in place, now that reality, when you have your hold your first child, it just it changes. changes all the yeah. dynamics. Yeah. So follow your dream early on. Take advantage of things. I, I have what I call my purple duck theory. As a kid, you know, you'd be at an arcade game. You put a quarter in, you get, and you got the these things going this way and this way. You know, if you get the slow moving ones, you get ten point. A little bit faster, you get fifteen. You know, that kind of thing. And then once a game, the purple duck comes up, and if you get it, you get a free game. But most people, oh my goodness, there's a purple duck. Now it's gone. Yeah. When that purple duck shows up, shoot it. Yeah. <laughs> Take advantage of, you know, those opportunities because some of them are very fleeting. You know, it's like that purple duck. It's not going to sit there and wait for you to make up your mind. <laughs> you know, so I, I strongly believe in that. And I also firmly believe there's a, a lot of luck involved. I mean, like I said, from the day one in this room, yeah. that very first session being the right place at the wrong time. <laughs> at, you know, you can either be in the right place at the right time or you can be in the right place at the wrong time. Yeah, you know, yeah. so there is definitely a good portion of luck involved. But you've got to have the skills and the talent and be ready when that opportunity, when that purple duck comes along, <laughs> snag it. Yeah. Great, yeah. great advice. Well, it seems like you grabbed many more than just one purple duck. <laughs> there were many purple ducks I that got, you were able to. Yeah, I, I mean, right place at the right time. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. man. Boy, yeah. Pete, thank you so much. This has been fantastic thank to experience. You. On behalf yeah. of the sessions, we thank you so much. Good luck, good, 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 good luck. Indeed, thank you. <laughs> Dom Famulao here, the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.